how this goes. So thank you all for coming to our pathway analysis tutorial this morning. Um, my name is Marissa Macchietto, and I am a bioinformatics analyst at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, along with my co-instructor Tom Kono here. He will be presenting the hands-on tutorial in the afternoon, so right after lunch, um, and he'll show you how to use um, the cluster profiler wrapper script here at MSI, which is a command line command that you can run on your differential gene expression results table to produce a bunch of pathway results. And we're going to kind of cover in this lecture portion kind of what uh, what might be spit out of cluster profiler wrapper um, and just kind of cover uh, you know what pathway analysis entails. So first slide, what is pathway analysis? Um, they are analysis techniques that are used to summarize things that are changing in an experiment. And those things could be biological pathways or biological processes. They could be molecular functions of those genes. Um, they could be cellular compartments, or they could even be chromosomes. So they could be a lot of things. It just depends on what you define um, that gene set as or what that pathway is. So it's very, it's tech, uh, mostly exploratory analysis. Um, and it's typically performed after a bulk RNA-seq experiment or a single cell RNA-seq experiment. Um, and you've obtained a differential gene expression results table. And so it typically operates from that differential gene expression results table. So here's kind of like an illustration of that. So I have over here a portion of a differential gene expression results table for a comparison that was done between flies that were overexpressing a gene called Bromer, so BMM, versus flies that were wild type, which is like the baseline group. And so in this comparison, you know, we overexpress this gene, and actually we see that gene here um, in our at the top of our differential gene expression table as being five-fold overexpressed over the control group, and you know, they're all highly significant. Everything that I'm showing here is highly significant. But if you were to look at the full table, um, you'd see that actually all the genes that have a false discovery rate less than 0.05, there are 112 genes. And that could be a kind of a lot to go through. I mean, there are different, differential gene expression results tables that have way more genes that are differentially expressed. And it's impossible to just go through them one by one and looking up each gene individually. Although now with chat GPT, you could probably just put this list of differential expression genes in and be like, well, what are the functions? And it will just spit out what those functions are to give you kind of like a sense of what everything's doing. But this is where pathway analysis will come in. So this is why we would use it is because it will help us derive meaning from the results of these high throughput experiments where there's so many different features and it can be overwhelming to look at each gene one by one. Um, but then they can also help us validate or confirm expected results. So in my Bromer overexpression experiment, we know that Bromer is involved in met metabolism. So that is the pathway that I would, you know, pathways related to metabolism are what I'd look for as being changing in this experiment. And they can help us generate new hypotheses and help us design subsequent experiments. Like let's say a pathway comes up that you're, you had no idea was related to what you were studying. Um, maybe that could be a starting point for something new. So there are two pathway analysis, pathway analysis techniques I'll talk about today. These are the main ones out there and the most commonly used ones. Uh, the first is overrepresentation analysis, and the second, hello, oh, no worries, is um, gene set enrichment analysis. So they ask slightly different questions, um, but essentially they both arrive at, is this gene set enriched uh, in my experiment? So one is asking, are more, you know, given a gene set, like a, a set of genes, so like if I'm doing a differential gene expression experiment, and I have my 112 genes for overrepresentation analysis, I could provide those 112 differentially expressed genes and ask, is pathway X enriched in my test set? Oh. oh. I didn't even realize we weren't. I mean, it's fine, but now, now that we have two Yes. All right. 
sorry, one second. Uh, can everyone on Zoom hear me? You can uh, send a chat. To, okay, great. Got a thumbs up. Thank you. All right. All right. So um, the other pathway analysis technique uh, is gene set enrichment analysis. And so with gene set enrichment analysis, we're not look. You know, you're not providing a small set of genes. You're providing all of your tested genes, and you're ranking all of those tested genes on some metric. And you're saying, is this uh, gene set um, over or upper underrepresented in one treatment group versus the other? So we'll dig into that a little bit more. Oops. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about the biological pathways we're using for these different um, pathway analysis techniques. So there are the most commonly used databases I've seen are gene ontology, um, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, or KEG. Reactome and then molecular signatures database, which actually encompasses the first three databases I mentioned, and it has many more. And there are actually a lot more databases out there, but these are the ones we're just going to talk about today, and because I know more about them. <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of pathway terms that you can find in these databases, and they can include things like cell cycle, striated muscle contraction, Huntington's disease, kinase activity. This is like barely grazing the surface. But the point is that you might see some of these terms in, across multiple databases. So you'll see cell cycle in Go, you'll see it in KEG, you'll see it in Reactome, because it's you know a very basic common term. But then some of these others, like Huntington's disease, might not be in Go or might not be in KEG, but you might see it in Reactome. So depending on what you're interested in, what your experiment is about, you should try to look over the databases and find you know, ones that have the pathway terms you're interested in. Because otherwise, if you don't check, you're just gonna compare it to a database and your term's not gonna show up and then you're gonna be disappointed. And in fact, it's not that it wasn't enriched, it's just it wasn't there. But every pathway term, so cell cycle, for example, is defined by a set of genes. So all the genes that have been annotated at in some way with cell cycle will be in that gene set. Though, you know, depending on what database you're looking at, there could be different sets of genes defining cell cycle. Maybe they're not all exactly the same. So that is just another important thing to note. Okay, so the first database I'm going to talk about is gene ontology. So I define what an ontology is over here. Let me just move this over. Um, but it's a set of concepts and categories in a subject area or domain that shows their properties and relations between them. So that will make a little more sense when I show the next slide. But basically, the terms that are in Go are hierarchically and relationally related to each other. And there are three separate ontologies. There is biological process, molecular function, and cellular component. So each one is targeted to, you know, a, to looking at different things. So if you're really interested on, in whether the set of genes you have have kinase activity, you would look at molecular function. But if you're more interested in like developmental processes or path, signaling pathways, you might look at you know, the biological process ontology. And if you're more interested in where things are located inside the cell, you would look at the cellular component ontology. But every term in Go, has an ID associated with it. And so it always starts with the GO colon and then some number. And so this example is showing us that this GO term, is the description of this GO term is stem cell maintenance. And the genes that have been annotated with GO terms are annotated that way based on different sources of evidence. So the most clear cut is experimental evidence. Like I've knocked out this gene and it's affected the cell cycle. So therefore, this gene is related to cell cycle processes. So I'm gonna annotate it with cell cycle. The next is phylogenetic evidence. So maybe we've discovered that that gene that's involved in cell cycle does some, you know, is involved in cell cycle in human, but the ortholog of that gene in mouse that shares the same amino acid sequence might also be involved in cell cycle. So we can translate that cell cycle annotation over to the, its ortholog. 
Then there's computational evidence. So this could be like protein domain information, like for example, a protein sequence has what looks like a zinc finger domain in it. So we can say, okay, it has a zinc finger domain in it. That means it must bind DNA. So it has some kind of DNA binding activity. So it will be annotated with that. Then there are author statements, curatorial statements, and then automatically generated annotations. And so those are, um, could be a little less confident in, you know, the automatically generated annotations are probably lower confidence than experimental evidence say. So if you really want to understand, I mean, I don't know how many people do this, but if they really wanted to dig into, you know, what genes are corresponding to a particular Go term and what evidence there is for it, you could go into Go and look up the evidence codes. So um, here is kind of what I was describing about those three ontologies, but this is like a very like zoomed in look into like a very small subset of them. So on in panel A, we have the molecular function ontology. In B, we have the biological process ontology. And in C, we have the cellular component ontology. And so what we're looking at here are the, is the hierarchical, uh, re, you know, relational database that I was telling you about. So I know it's kind of hard to see here, but um, if you like start at the bottom here, also let me just show this portion. So the way that this is shown, so this is a directed acyclic graph where on top we have like the root term or the parent term. And it's super general, super generic. Like we're talking molecular function, that's kind of like, you know, not very specific. Um, but as you go down this directed acyclic graph, you get more and more specific to the bottom where, you know, here we get peptidase activity and then we're even more specific where we have threonine type endopeptidase activity. And so if you look at the terms at the very top of these Go graphs, there are gonna be thousands of genes annotated with these terms. But as you go down the Go graph, you're gonna see that there are only gonna be tens to hundreds of genes annotated with that term. And so these Go graphs were actually produced by Go plot and cluster profiler. And so the way that they color code these boxes are, signifies you know, whether they're overrepresented or not. So everything that's super general and generic parent term wasn't overrepresented. Whereas, you know, some things that are like further down are significantly overrepresented and colored in red. So as I mentioned, this is produced with the Go plot function by cluster profiler R package. So you can totally, you know, download this package in R and process your data with it if you would like to generate something like this. I'll talk more about some of the other cluster profiler graphs um, later. And and for those of you who have joined us later, you know, Tom in the afternoon is going to talk about the cluster profiler wrapper, which runs a bunch of cluster profiler functions to generate plots and tables for you off of your differential gene expression results. Okay, so the next database we're going to talk about is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, or KEG. So KEG is, is similar to Go, but it doesn't have that, I don't think it has like that hierarchical relational graph structure. It's kind of like, and it's very metabolically oriented. So Go is more about cellular stuff. KEG is more about metabolism pathways, um, but it covers other things too. And so here's an example of like a metabolic pathway. So if you go into the KEG database, you can look through all of these met metabolic pathways and they have these cool diagrams of you know, all the proteins or genes and how they relate to each other in this pathway. So this pathway we're looking at a cell cycle. And I think this came from something I had done. Uh, this was cell cycle, cell cycle was um, downregulated. It looks like, um, and so I just wanted to point out some things about how to interpret this graph because there's a lot going on. <laughs> But generally, when you look at a path view, these keg path view plots, which can be generated with the path view package in R, um, what you kind of look to see is just like generally how many genes in this pathway are being perturbed. So they're actually colored to be green or red. If they're unchanged, those would look gray. So 
if the direction is up regulated, it will be red. And if it's down regulated, it will be green. Um, and then the next thing you'd look at is you have to like look at the actual arrows in the diagram and see what they're doing. So if they're arrows, that means they're activating. If they're whatever these are, Tom, what are those called? <laughs> the little T's, it's like repression, indicates repression in this graph. So if we kind of like look at a portion of this graph here, like we see SCF and skip two, those are getting downregulated and they repress these other genes or proteins. So downregulation of these genes actually causes upregulation of these genes. So you can see how, you know, this is kind of complex. You have both activating and uh, repressing genes in this pathway. But overall, we're seeing that it is getting downregulated. And so, I'll try to remember to mention this later, but you know, a lot of people ask, should I provide everything that's changing in my experiment or just the upregulated genes or just the downregulated genes? And so this is kind of a case to provide both because you don't know what, you know what these genes activities are. Are they repressors or activators? So by providing both, you should hopefully see something like this, but I can understand separating it too. It's just kind of good to do all three. Okay, so the next database is Reactome. So Reactome covers a lot of metabolism, signaling, transcriptional regulation, apoptosis, and disease, but I kind of think of it as being more disease related. So if you're working on human and mouse and are studying experiments that are related to you know, disease, this would be a good one to look at too. And finally, we have the Molecular Signatures database. These are the only ones I'm gonna to cover today. There are way more out there. But molecular signatures encompasses um, KEG and Reactome and Go, but it also has a lot of these other data sets too. A really good one is Hallmark. That is the, the default database that the cluster profiler wrapper uses. But there are also positional gene sets. So if you're interested in seeing whether all your genes that are changing in your experiment are coming from a, chrome, like a specific chromosome, if it's enriched by chromosome, you can compare it to this positional gene. Uh, database. If you're interested in microRNA regulatory targets, you can compare it to this one. If you're interested in seeing if there's enrichment for specific transcription factor targets, you can compare it to some of these others. And then there are databases that are specifically for cancer, like C6, some that are specifically for immunology signatures, and then there's specific cell type signatures too. Um, so all of these can be useful. And then one of these collections, sorry, I C1 through C8 are different collections of gene sets. So I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but some of these collections also have gene, like people who have submitted experiments to GEO or something, they've said, oh, you know, in my experiment, which was comparing macrophages stimulated with LPS versus macrophages that weren't stimulated with LPS, I see this gene set upregulated. And those gene, you know, those gene sets can be actually put into these molecular signatures databases and you can compare it to theirs. Like if you did a similar experiment, you could say, you know, compare using gene set enrichment analysis to see if you're getting the same result as they are. So ultimately, uh, what this comes down to is like choose the database that fits your needs. So think about what you're trying to what your experimental design is, what you're trying to find out and find the database most appropriate for them. Yes. Oh, for plants? Well, this should, you should be able to answer this one, Tom. <laughs> yeah, yes, sure. Okay, yeah. Um, so for plants, unfortunately, um, the best I think you're gonna get is with Go and maybe with um, keg and with go or no sorry with keg I think you're mostly going to be limited to the really well studied model species like like Asian rice or Arabidopsis and maybe like maize um, and then everything from there is going to be um, based on homology to those species um, with go I think I think go and inference of Go terms is pretty stable now that anytime that you get a new genome annotated 
you can at least tentatively assign some go terms so i think if you have a if there is a genome out there that's close enough to your study species then you can at least get go terms for them some of those genes but reactome and and um in hallmarks and stuff, and MSIGDB, those are all going to be, I mean, especially MSIGDB, it's like human and mouse only. And Reactome, I think, is like, I think it has human, mouse, maybe Drosophila and Saccharomyces. Yeah, I think they're. And, you know, it's, it's some of those like classical genetics uh, models. All of the species in the cluster profile wrapper that are covered have Reactome. Okay. Uh, models, I guess, or. Okay, yeah, so as Marissa mentioned, uh, the tool will show off this afternoon, uh, it supports, I think it's 13 species now. Um, all of those 13 species have reactome pathways, but I don't think any of them are plants. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. unfortunately, we're a bit limited in the plant world. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Tom. Let me just hook up the mic again. I don't know where he's, um, and just to also add to what Tom said, um, for those who are studying non-model organisms and need to figure out how to annotate them, I mean, there are a lot of tools out there, but one that I used a long time ago was Blastigo. So it will, you basically blast all your proteins to a Blast protein database, figure out best matches, and then you can use this GUI Blastigo to take those Blast results and try to figure out go terms that are associated with those blast results and apply them to your new organ, you know, your organism that has not been studied. Um, so that's one, one tool that could help those of you who are working in non-model organisms. Okay, so now we'll talk about overrepresentation analysis. So this is the first pathway analysis technique that we use to summarize things that are changing in experiment. And so with this uh, method, We'd give it, I feel like the biggest difference between overrepresentation analysis and gene set enrichment analysis is we're not giving it all the tested genes. We are just giving it a set of genes that maybe we found were differentially expressed in our experiment. So it's a small set between, you know, 100 to 1,000 genes or something, or ideally. Um, and so what we're asking is, are genes more associated with a particular pathway term, X, than would be expected in my significant gene set? So the input of this, like I said, could be you know, a set of differentially expressed genes that you found in your experiment, but it could also be like a module of genes from WGCNA. So that's weighted gene correlation network analysis. Like if you've done that and figured out all these genes that are co-expressed in similar fashion, winding up into the same module, and you want to know what those genes do without looking up each one one by one, you can apply overrepresentation analysis here. But it could be another set of interesting genes. Maybe you're looking at your PCA plot and you're like, okay, I see that all these samples are separated on PC1. So let me take the top PC1 loadings and run them through overrepresentation analysis to see if maybe they're related to anything. Um, but it could also be defined some other way. But here, I just wanted to point out that the gene list size does matter. Um, if you provide too few genes or too many genes, you're going to either have no results or t so many results you won't even know how, what, to, <laughs> what to do with them. Um, and they'll be unreliable. But so we've kind of set like this range of 150 genes to 600 genes, but you know, you could go up to 800. I just wouldn't give it like 3000 genes or 5000 genes because that's like half your entire transcriptome that's changing. Um, and that will just be kind of weird. <laughs> um, if you do have like 5000 genes that are changing in your experiment, you could subset it to like the top most differentially expressed, you know, set or, you know, set a hard, a hard threshold, like the top 500 or something. Let's see what they do. Okay, so I had shown you this Go plot earlier. Um, and now I wanted to dig into some of the boxes in the Go plot um, and how to interpret these numbers. So if we just take this most uh, enriched, um, Go term here, that Go term has this Go ID. This is how its p-value significance from overrepresentation analysis. 
And this is the description of the term. So it's threonine type endopeptidase activity. What these numbers down here are telling us is the gene set that I provided that were differentially expressed genes, for example, we had 69 of those genes. And eight of them, of that set, have this annotation, threonine type endopeptidase activity. When we compare all of the non-differentially expressed genes that we've tested, um, 19 of you know, the rest of them have, uh, have this term, threonine type endopeptidase activity. So you can already tell proportionally, it's, more, it's pretty enriched in our test set. So here's kind of how you'd break it down, like what I just said. So we had 69 genes that are differentially expressed in our experiment. Here are how many genes that are not differentially expressed. And here are the genes in our total universe. That means after we filtered out everything that wasn't expressed and wasn't worth testing in edge R or DC2, these are how many genes we have to work with. Do not provide all the genes. If you provide all the genes, uh, you're going to get a more unreliable result. It, these are the ones that are most feasible to use for your experiment because they're actually expressed by your cells. And so now if we, we could break it down. So we have these 69 genes that are differentially expressed. Eight of them have this term, threonine type of endopeptidase activity. 61 don't. And then when we look at all the reference genes, uh, 19 have the term, 11,000 don't. And so you could take this matrix, run it through Fisher's exact test, or more preferably hyper, a hypergeometric test to give you your p-value, which will tell us if our gene set is over, 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 yeah, if our term or gene set is overrepresented in our test set. So here is an example results table that you get out of running overrepresentation analysis using cluster profiler or a related tool. Uh, first column in this cluster profiler results table is the go term ID. Then we have the description. And then this is just what we covered before, which is uh, these numbers here. Um, and then we got, we have our p-value, our adjusted p-value and our q-value. q-value being the most conservative, I would use that for plotting. And the count here are the number of genes which are listed here that have this annotation that came from our query set or a test set. I, I use those two interchangeably, query or test set. They both refer to, I'm so sorry, whatever gene set we've provided to determine whether things are overrepresented or not. All right. So now let's talk about the types of visualizations you could do using this table. So again, this is cluster profiler focused. So the dot plot function is one that cluster profiler provides and can produce a dot plot that looks like this. So here I have plotted the results of that Bromer overexpression experiment I talked about earlier. Um, and so what we have are, this is configurable in that I can tell it how many terms I want it to plot. Do I want to plot the top 10, top 20, top 50, top 100? You can set that, uh, that number. Um, and so these are the term names. And then what we have are, like what the dots are showing us, the size of the dots tell us how many genes are annotated with this term in our test or query set. The um, gene ratio down here is telling us the coverage of that gene set in our list, like the list of genes we provided. So like 35 or almost 40% of our genes that we provided are related to cell cycle. Um, and then the color of the dots indicate the adjusted p-value here. All right, sorry, it's not advancing. Okay, so the next plotting function that Cluster Profiler offers is called the C network plot. So there are network plots that show all of the terms that you wanted to plot and what genes are associated with those terms. And so what you could see is that, you know, some of the genes are going to be shared between two terms. And so these larger nodes are the, the terms 
the smaller nodes are the genes associated with that term. And then the color of the genes will tell you what the fold change of that gene is associated with that term. So if we look at this one, for example, keratinization, formation of the cornified envelope, all these genes around here look like they're basically getting downregulated in this experiment. And the size of the term node tells us how many genes are actually part of that node. And I just also wanted to mention real quick, let me go back a few slides that, you know, you're going to get a lot of terms out, but some of them, like, for example, response to biotic stimulus and response to external biotic stimulus, all of the same genes are part of those two terms. Like they completely overlap in terms of what genes are shared. So you're going to see hits to both of them, and they basically have the exact same statistics here. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, all right, and sorry, I should have advanced earlier, but this is basically reiterating what I told you. The hub nodes are the terms, the other nodes are the genes, and the color indicates the directionality of the genes expression. Okay, so here's another type of network plot that you can do with cluster profiler using the emap plot function. This one will remove all the genes, but now we're, what we're gonna do is visualize how these terms are related to each other. Um, oops, excuse me. So in this small example, you know, we see like all of these nodes connected to each other and you know, by these thick edges. And those thick edges are the numbers of, represent the numbers of genes that are overlapping between those two terms. Um, so response to other organism and response to bacterium. A lot of the genes that respond to other organisms might also respond to bacterium. So you'll see both of those being enriched in those terms, both, like those sets of genes being enriched in both terms. And so you can kind of get a sense like on this side of the plot over here is response to biotic stimuli. And then on this side of the plot, you're seeing response to abiotic stimuli. So it's just heat or uh, temperature or UV. But whatever it is, you know, whatever differentially expressed genes we gave this, uh, you know, whatever we gave to overrepresentation analysis found these terms that were enriched, and here's how they all relate to each other. So you're kind of getting a sense of, like, you're able to see like the biological themes that are occurring in your experiment with this. It's like a nice, clear, more clear way to look at it than trying to look through this list of terms in the dot plot and being like, okay, well, they all seem to be cell cycle related. You know, when you plot it this way, it's more like, okay, I see like this network module over here and maybe you'll have a dis disconnected network over module over here to see what's, you know, what's disjointed and what's not not disjointed. So this slide is just kind of covering what I've just shown you, like the dot plot will just list out what's significant and tell you how much of your test set is covered by the term. The C network plots will show you not only the terms, but the genes that are part of those terms and the directionality of those genes if you're interested in knowing certain genes, like what direction they're going in. Um, and it will help you see what genes are shared across terms and what also what terms are highly connected to each other. And the EMAP plot will show you those bio themes that I was telling you about, how terms are related to each other. All right, and again, all three of these plot types are available by through the cluster profiler R package. Um, so you're free to use it. But again, the other ways you can use Aura it doesn't have to be just for gene, differential gene expression results. You can use it for WGCNA, or you can use it for, you know, maybe PC loadings. I don't know. It's 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 up to you. However, you've kind of curated a gene set, like um, computationally, you could try to test it with Aura to see if if that's um, interesting. But I also want to say that pathway analysis is. I like to use it as a guide. You know to seeing what's changing in the experiment, but it's not, you know, like absolute, you know, <laughs> like, um, so let's next cover gene set enrichment analysis. Um, so GSEA, um, instead of operating off of just a small query set of genes you're giving it, it's going to take all of the genes that you've tested in your experiment. 
So if this was like a human differential gene expression test, you know, you start with 60,000 genes that you're assaying expression for before you, you know, when you do differential gene expression testing, you'd reduce that gene set like number because you're going to filter out all those genes that are not variable or that are, you know, zero across the board for your group. There's no point in testing those genes because there is no expression there. So what you're left with is a smaller set of genes, like 15,000 genes or so, that you will test with your DSeq2 or your EDGR programs. And so what I'm showing here is an example of those 15,000 genes that have been tested and ranked um, by some metric, which we'll cover in a second. But what you're seeing here is, you know, what the expression looks like in heat map for group A and group B. So everything that's red could be overexpressed, everything that's blue is underexpressed. And with gene set enrichment analysis, we could take a gene set and say, like cell cycle, for example, which cell cycle is defined by these genes plus others. What I, the question I'm asking here is where do these genes fall in this ranked list? Are they more skewed towards the top or are they most, more skewed towards the bottom? If they're more skewed towards the top, then they're overrepresented in group A. If they're more skewed towards the bottom, they're more overrepresented in group B, right? So the question is, how do we rank these genes? Like you can use any, like an, any number of ranking criteria. You can use, excuse me, the log of, negative log of the p-value. You could use log to fold change, or you can use a combination of the negative log of the p-value and then also include what the fold change direction is, if it's positive or negative. So you're using significance plus the sign of the fold change. Um, and so, like, let's say we've ranked these genes in this list based off of this. This is the preferred. Number th the, the third listed is our preferred method for ranking genes because it's not only, not only is significance important, but the direction. So let's rank these genes in this list, but I wanted to point out that when you do rank genes, by p-value, um, negative log of p-value, you will ra uh, run into this issue where genes will become tied because they'll have equivalent p-values. Like if they're not significant at all, a p-value of one, you'll probably see a lot of genes with p-value one in the center here. And so those can get randomly placed into this ranked list, right? Because it, the computer doesn't know which gene <laughs> is more significant. I can't rank everything that's one. So, so things at the top and bottom will have be able to be ranked properly. Things in the center <laughs> are going to not be ranked properly and can be randomly assigned there. Just wanted to point that out to you. And it's good to kind of export your ranking, your gene ranking, just to have that. Um, in case you want to repeat it, because every time you might repeat this, you could get a slightly different result. But you know, it's probably a really good idea to repeat gene set enrichment analysis multiple times to just make sure your results are robust. And that it's not like you're getting a completely different result the next time you run it. That would be scary. So, all right, so let me give you, um, you know, I kind of to told you before, uh, we take a gene set, so, let me just uh, recap. So we have our, our expression matrix on the side here where our genes have been ranked by negative log of the p-value times fold change. And now what we can do is take a term, response to hypoxia, and ask, where are the genes that are related to response to hypoxia within this list of ranked genes? And these black bars represent where those genes are. So already when you look at this, you can see like, okay, a lot of those response to hypoxia genes are towards the top. But how do we quantify that? So the way that um, GSEA does it is it uses this running sum statistic where it walks down your list gene by gene. And every time it doesn't hit a gene in the gene set, which is response to hypoxia, it decreases your enrichment score. And every time that it hits a gene, in your gene set, then it increases the enrichment score. And the enrichment score will increase 
based on the metric you've used to rank it. So if there's a really significant gene and it hits it, it's going to increase by a lot. Whereas when it's in the center here, where there's metrics that are, you know, negative log of one, you know, it's not going to increase by anything. So this is what it looks like. So what I just described, every time it hits a gene in this list, it increases. And every time it doesn't, it decreases a little. And so it has like this really jagged walk up this mountain. And when you get to the peak of the mountain, that is your maximum enrichment score. And that maximum enrichment score is what is reported for that gene set. So let's talk about the enrichment score. Uh, again, it's equal to the peak of your random walk. It's calculated using the running sum statistic. And so the magnitude of it is, and the magnitude is correlated with the phenotype. So, and lastly, um, it represents the degree to which a gene set is overrepresented at the top or bottom of the list. So you can have, if it's, represented at the top of the list, it would be a positive enrichment score. If it's represented at the bottom of the list, it would be a negative enrichment score. So you'll see what that looks like. I know we're only showing a enriched data set in group A, but you'll see what it looks like for an enriched data set in group B in a second. Okay, so after we calculate the enrichment score, we want to determine if it's like, you know, accurate or, or valid. <laughs> Like, so what we do is we normalize it by a bunch of permutations of the data. So what we do is we go back here to our ranked list and we randomize all the genes on the list. Just completely randomize it and then ask, just repeat the running sum statistic for that randomized gene set. And so, or not randomized gene set, randomized gene list. Excuse me, sorry, just out of it. Okay, so we do this not one time, but like 10,000 times. And every time we're getting an enrichment score for each permeated gene uh, ranking. And the normalized enrichment score is then the real enrichment score we got for our, our actual data set over the average of all of those permuted enrichment scores. So the larger the magnitude of this um, normalized enrichment score, the stronger our result or the better the result. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, this is the primary statistic used for examining the gene set enrichment results. Don't use enrichment score, used negative, uh, sorry, normalized enrichment score. Because this score can actually be compared across gene sets. So the larger the magnitude, um, and, and the sign also is important. So the sign and the magnitude tell you what you need to know about what's happening in this uh, analysis. And um, so it, it also accounts for the size of our gene set and the correlations that exist between genes in the gene set. So when we permute the data, we're breaking the correlations that exist between genes. Um, so now, uh, you know, that's taken into account. And to calculate significance, the kolmogorov smirnov test is used. So we're comparing the enrichment score we got to the distribution of enrichment scores we get from the permitted data and ask, is it, you know, what's the probability that what we've asked, you know, what we've, uh, what we got for our enrichment score is falling, you know, outside of the probability distribution that we just generated. So, all right. So let's look at some gene GSEA plots. So these are the GSE plots. So remember that. This is what a GSEA plot looks like. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we have an example of a gene set that is high in the test and an example of a gene set that is low in the test versus control. So this could be like Bromer versus wild type or test versus control, whatever. But just, this is just to show you that um, when it becomes negative, it actually goes below the, the zero uh, x-axis here. So to rehash what we had talked about, when you see a, a GSEA plot that's high in the test, you'd have a positive NES 
If it's negative, you have a negative NES. And so what I like to pay attention to when I'm looking at these plots is the bar here. So on, the, on this x-axis, we have all of these like black dashes, right? Those dashes represent the genes in our gene set. And you can see like it is more dense on one side for this, for like uh, the genes are more dense on the left side of the plot. Sorry, are you getting feedback? My hair. <laughs> okay. um, and then on this uh, on this other um, on this other GSEA plot, you're seeing the density higher over here. But you know, I, ideally, you want to see the density kind of skewed towards one side and not just distributedly distributed evenly throughout. Um, that makes it a little bit harder to interpret. But the other thing you're seeing here is the, the metric used for ranking. So when that, when we walk down this gene list, the first gene we hit had such a high, you know, significance level that it just shot up our enrichment score. And we ended up hitting the maximum really soon after. Um, and same with this side, the first couple genes in this uh, gene set were so significant that, you know, we we hit this enrichment score really soon. So that red dash line that I've uh, drawn here is the maximum, the enrichment score. And so everything in that box is called the leading edge. So the leading edge is comprised of those genes of our gene set that are winding, that have contributed to that maximum enrichment score, if that makes sense. Um, so let's take a look at uh, the gene set enrichment results table. I'm going to speed this up since we're 10 minutes away. Oops. So, um, so here's an example of a GSEA results table. We have our GSEA uh, pathway term here. And then we have set size. So these are the number of genes that are annotated with this pathway term that are present in our experiment. What do I mean by that? So if we have if you look up reactome DNA repair, maybe you'll see actually there's 330 genes involved in DNA repair. But right now we're only reporting 322 because that's what's feasible in our experiment. Those are the genes that we gave to GSEA. So that is the set size. And uh, the enrichment score is what we talked about um, before. And then here's the normalized enrichment score. So you can see that it's uh, negative two, so that means this gene is, or this gene set is actually um, enriched in the baseline group, so not the test group, it's the control group that it's enriched in. Oh, sorry, I realized that we have a, <laughs> um, we have it, descriptions here. So, so genes associated with pathway term, enrichment score, we have our normalized enrichment score, which again is influenced by how we've permuted the data, the number of permutations we've performed, and the size of the expression set. And then we have p-value, false discovery rate, and family-wise error rate. So you could use the family-wise if you want the most conservative, um, you know, uh, like estimate of this enrichment. Um, and then we have a rank at max. So this is the gene um, that gives us the gene number in our list that gives us that enrichment score. So when we hit the last DNA repair term uh, gene that gave us our maximum enrichment, that was gene number 3296. So the smaller the rank, like the smaller the value of the rank, the better, because that means the leading edge, you know, we obtained, sorry. Eh, so that means that we hit that enrichment score sooner down our rank list than further down our rank list, right? And this core enrichment column is telling us all of the genes that are actually comprising that leading edge, where the order of the gene is matters. So like the first gene in the list is the first gene that it hits that provides a real bump in enrichment score. And now we can talk about the leading edge statistics. So, you know, these are good to look at because the first, the tags percentage tells us how much of our, um, of our gene set is covered. So 
So of all of the genes in our gene sets, so like, for example, there are 322 genes in DNA repair. Um, how many of them are winding up in the leading edge? That 39% of them, of all of the genes for DNA repair are winding up in the leading edge. And then we have a list percentage, which is uh, the percentage of genes that are covered by the leading edge out of the whole rank list. So in this example, there are like 21,000 genes. And then, you know, here, I don't know, that's 2,500 genes. So, I mean, this isn't the exact, this isn't corresponding to this first one, but you know, it's what, what percentage of this whole list is covered by the leading edge. And then the signal is a combination of these two um, percentages, and that's actually shown on the other side, but it just tells you, and you can look at this later when you're going through this deck again, but the higher the signal, the better the result. So for example, this one down here, you know, uh, we obtained the leading edge, like uh, in the first 8% of genes, like of the list, like that's pretty, uh, a pretty, um, an enrichment score that we reached pretty soon in our list. And so our signal is really high due to that, but also due to the percent tags. So but to the percent tags number. So anyway, that's just how to kind of interpret those results. But when it comes to running gene set enrichment analysis, I've listed all these bullet points of things to consider. The first is what database to use, like what gene sets do you want to run this against? You don't want to do everything under the sun because then you have a lot of multi like multiple corrections you'll have to do, you know, if you taste, uh, test everything under the sun. The next thing is to decide on what ranking metric you'd like to use. So you could use log two fold change or you can use negative log of the p-value times the direction of fold change, which is preferred. The next thing is what, how many, uh, what type of permutation to perform. So in cluster profiler, you don't have the option of choosing to permute by samples. It will just permute by genes. But if you do download GSCA for your desktop, you can permute by samples and that would be preferred because instead of, you know, you're not breaking correlations of genes now, um, you are just randomizing what samples are part of your control group or your test group, repeating gene set enrichment analysis after you've swapped samples around and then asking, is it still like, are you still seeing um, an enrichment in this gene set or not? Um, but, Right now, cluster profiler and the cluster profiler wrapper only do permutation by gene. And the other thing to consider is the number of permutations to perform. You would want to do greater than 10,000 if possible. Like, um, I know a lot of people might, dip, you know, reduce that number to speed it up, but it's, it's better to have 10,000 or more for this analysis. Um, and the other thing is, pay attention to the size of the genes that you're going to put into gene set enrichment analysis. You don't want to run gene set enrichment analysis on a thousand genes. You want, you know, unless this is a bacterium or something that has very few genes or something. But if this is like human, you wouldn't want to run a thousand genes through it. You'd want to run like 15,000 genes through it um, or, or something like that. You know, whatever is, possible in your experiment, um, like possibly expressed in your experiment. And then the last thing to pay attention to is gene set size. And here I'm referring to the pathways that we're comparing to. Like some pathways might have like eight genes. You don't want to figure out the ranking of those eight genes in your 20,000 list, you know, 20,000 ranked gene list. That will not be a good result. <laughs> but similarly, you don't want a gene set that has like 5,000 genes in it, because figuring out where those 5,000 genes are in your list of 15,000 genes is going to be kind of weird too. So find a gene set that's like in a sweet spot, you know, minimum 25 genes, maybe maximum of 500 for this purpose. And Cluster Profiler does offer like parameters that you can set these, you know, numbers. So min gene set size 25, max gene set size 500, you know, 
and so on. Okay, sorry, uh, two minutes. Um, okay, the other considerations, um, again, use the full DEG table. Don't give it a subset of the DEG table. Everything that you've tested in your experiment is valid for ranking and then choose what criteria you'd like to rank on. So you could just take your DEG table, add a new column, or you take the negative log of the p-value, do p-value here instead of FDR, um, and then times the fold change direction. So here's like kind of an example of that, what that looks like. Um, and then you can use this for ranking, for ranking these genes. So re-rank, resort this based on these new values and then put that into GSEA. Okay, so that about covers the lecture portion. Tom is going to give you a tutorial on how to use the cluster profiler wrapper at 1 p.m. Um, and the MSI developed cluster profiler wrapper will perform both over representation analysis and gene set enrichment analysis for you, um, given that you provide the full DEG results table from EDGE-R or DEC2. And this script is run from the command line, like I mentioned before. So Tom is gonna walk you how, through how to do that and open on demand. And also show you open on demand if you don't know what it is because it's pretty awesome. And um, so yeah, that, that about covers it. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask in the chat or in person. All right, thank you. We'll resume at 1 p.m. Yep, thank you. Um, so I'll let me see see if I can figure out how to pause the recording. I think there is. Um, so yep, we'll break for an hour and I'll see you at one o'clock back here. I just remembered my apologies. Um, uh, if you if you were joining us for the if you joined us for RNA seq a couple of weeks ago, this will be very familiar. Um, this is the same kind of command line refresher that we had. Uh, so anything that's in this red red box and bold text is a warning. It's it's definitely important. It may it is not necessarily directly related to the tutorial, but it's something that will come up um, throughout your usage of MSI, and it's something that I really want you to pay attention to because it's a common problem or it's a potential for failure. <clears throat> and then you'll see a lot of this. Anything that's in this gray background in monospace font. Uh, that's like code or a literal statement that you have to enter or some kind of like box, you, you, user interface box that you click on. It's like something that you input into the computer somehow. So when you see this, that's how I'm trying to uh, signify that. Uh, there's these little boxes with arrows. This is like definitely, you know, unrelated to tutorial, but it's just something that you might be interested in seeing and you can open those and, and look at them if you want. Um, and then a final formatting cue, you might see this a few times, is if there's short commands that you have to enter, they'll just kind of appear on one line. And if there's long commands, uh, I've broken it up over multiple lines with these backslash and then new line characters. You don't have to enter those in the command line when you're following along. I just did that because the way that this page is displaying, displays things, if you have a really long command, you have to scroll side to side to see it, and that's just annoying. Um, and so breaking it up like that lets it stay kind of in one narrow column it's easier to see but when you're entering it you don't have to you don't have to put backslash new line it doesn't hurt it's just you don't have to so with that out of the way we can continue like with the actual guts of the tutorial so by the end of this really what i want you to know is um, you should know the major public databases that are used for storing gene interaction data and annotated gene sets. MRSA went over that in detail in the morning session. Um, so that's, a, that's you know, that objective uh, taken care of, hopefully. And these next two are the ones we're going to tackle in the afternoon session, which is we want you to be able to run the MSI developed script for pathway enrichment analysis and GSEA. And then to get familiar with and know how to read and interpret the results of those two analyses. And this, after the command line refresher, we'll run some uh, pathway enrichment and gene set enrichment analyses, and we'll actually look at the plots and we'll talk about what they mean. Um, so this tutorial, just to kind of give you a sense of what we do and do not cover, we will use the hands-on MSI develop tool, which is one that we officially support. So if you are running this on your own research data, you can talk to us and we'll like, figure out how to run it with you and troubleshoot it with you. 
<clears throat> there are a lot of other similar tools in this space. So you may have heard of David or Gorilla or the Ingenuity Pathway Analysis from Kaijin. These all do very similar things, um, but because they're not software that we either run or developed ourselves or are necessarily experts in running, or in the case of IPA, we don't have a license for it. Um, and so we can't really support those. Uh, the results that we produce with our cluster profiler wrapper tool will do a lot of the same stuff that these tools do, and they look very similar, but um, you know, we can't make the swap in between. And also, um, you know, the, the, the statistical methods are relatively standardized, and so you might get very similar results from these tools anyway. Um, and the data that we're going to go through today are from a bulk RNA-seq experiment, and a lot of the interpretation is done in the context of gene expression responses. And, you know, higher, higher counts means it's higher expression, and therefore you can imagine it being upregulated. You can use the same uh, results, for, you use the same type of results from other types of genomic experiments, for example, methylation experiments or ATAC-seq or any other kind of functional genomic assay. Because, you know, as you saw from the morning portion, all you really need is a way to rank your gene list or, or come up with a subset of your genes that are interesting, which you can do with any kind of genomics technology. But keep in mind that the interpretation is likely going to be different when you have those different types of um, genomic assays. Like, I know that promoter methylation and gene body methylation mean different things than RNA-seq accounts. So just keep that in mind when you're uh, using these tools. Um, so as I mentioned, this tutorial is a command line tutorial, so the prerequisites are you are familiar with the command line, and because you're here for this, this introductory section, we're going to get you familiar with the command line at the level that's necessary to run this tool. But there are links to other resources here that are more detailed, and as you start to use MSI more, you might find these useful as you, you know, grow beyond just following the exercises in this tutorial. Um, so before we like start entering commands, uh, I like to kind of step back and think about the paradigm of how we are interacting with computers. And the first way I start with that, and I apologize to people who have like a computer science or computer engineering background, because I'm going to like grossly oversimplify this. Um, <clears throat> I like to think about things in context of the shell. And at least for me, now I may not know the technical, the strict technical definition of a shell, um, but at least for me, a functional definition of it is just a user interface that allows me to interact with the operating system on the computer. And I think of them as either being graphical or textual in nature. So like this one that we have here with the web browser window and the mouse cursor that I can click and drag on, uh, that's a graphical shell. You've got pictures and, and graphics that you can interact with. Um, if you're using a Windows computer, that's also got you know the graphical shell. You can click on things and interact with it that way. If you've used the Linux desktop, which we will later on, that's another, that's another graphical shell running on MSI systems. Um, and if you think about the, you know, like the, the classical command line, that's that black and white window with the blinking cursor that you type things on, that's the, a textual shell. And they both let you do the same things. They both let you send commands to the operating system. It's just the nature in which you're communicating is slightly different. So it, at least it helped me to think about when I'm typing things on the command line shell, I am entering commands in the same way where if I was clicking on pictures and dragging things around on the desktop. And it just kind of helps me think, okay, how do I come up with a textual representation for what I want to do graphically? Um, so, you know, with that in mind, we can start to, you know, run command lines and think, okay, here's how, what it would look like when we're using a graphical um, counterpart for it. Also, I'm gonna, <clears throat> let me pause and ask, can people hear me okay on, online? Am I coming through okay? If, I, if I'm not coming through at all, they won't even have heard. <laughs> Hopefully people can hear me. If they see me gesturing and scrolling, they, they will have known I'm talking. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna start to access a command line on MSI now. So if you open your web browser and navigate to this, I made a clickable link here, oog.msi.umn.edu. Um, I'm gonna open this in a new tab. So unfortunately I'll be switching back and forth between these two browser tabs, but I'll try to keep a, the jarring transitions to a minimum. Now, if you, I think we're already logged in here as Marissa. Is it okay if I run this as your, your account, Marissa? <laughs> okay. 
Um, and so if you're not already logged into an MSI system, you'll, be, you'll get greeted with that U of M login page, and this time you will need to use Duo because you will be accessing a system that has that multiple factor authentication requirement. Um, so if you get greeted with the U of M login form, make sure you, you have your Duo device ready. I'll also take a moment to mention that if you are connecting from Oh, I think you I think you need to be on the VPN to get to on, on demand as well. So if you're connecting from off campus or outside the campus network, you'll have to be connected through the U of M IT OIT VPN. Um, and there's some links in here that go out to uh, those resources if you're not enrolled in that yet. But once you get to when, once you get to this page here with our very large logo, you'll know that you have connected to open on demand successfully. And at the very top of the window, there's this little drop down menu called clusters. So click on clusters, you'll get a drop down with agate and wasabi. Uh, we'll, we'll use agate today. Um, it's a bigger cluster, so there's hopefully less contention for uh, resources on it. So over on this window, I'll click on clusters and then agate, and it will open a new tab, and it will give you, just like I described, that classical like black background white text with a cursor. Um, this is really all you need to do to get a command line on MSI systems. It's really easy now. Um, and I think on demand is great for that. So we'll jump back over here. And yeah, <clears throat> in this case, the screenshots, screenshots show my com um, terminal window, but for today we'll be using Marissa's. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you know, we've got a blinking cursor and the white text. I'll mention here that throughout the tutorial and as you talk to other, you know, computery people, you may hear people talk about the prompt or, or when your prompt comes back or something like that. And so it's helpful to know what that actually means. So this bit here in this screenshot of my command line, it, you know, it has base and then you'll see you recognize my username and then at some, some string of characters and then another string of characters and then this, this box. All of the text before that box is called the prompt. And when you type a command, text will show up after the prompt and to the left of the cursor. Um, and the prompt is, I think of it at least functionally as a way of the computer saying like, I'm ready to receive your next input. If you don't see the prompt yet, that means something is still running and you know, it'll, it'll take some time. As you'll see in our tutorial, or at least in, the, in this intro section, all of the commands are pretty quick. They'll happen almost instantaneously. So you, you type something and press enter, the prompt will come right back. And so it may seem like everything should be that snappy, but sometimes the, the commands take a while. And as you'll see today, we'll, we'll run some commands that do take a couple minutes to run. Um, but when you see that prompt come back is when you know the computer is finished, whatever you asked it to do, and it's ready to, take to, to enter your next command. Um, also note that even though we have a graphical shell here, do remember that our terminal is a textual shell. It doesn't understand when you're clicking and moving around. So if you're typing a long command and you need to jump back somewhere to like, let's say you accidentally made a typo and you go, oh, I need to, you know, I misspelled that word. I need to jump back, you know, 30 characters and change the spelling of a word. Unfortunately, you cannot click there with your mouse and move the cursor. You have to use the left arrow on your keyboard and you have to press it however many times to like move your cursor back one letter at a time and then backspace and then type the right word. It's a bit, it, it can take some time, but you know, just know that you can't click and move. Um, so, I know we opened a terminal, but before before I, you know, start telling you to enter commands, I want to take another moment here to talk about the way data and objects are organized on a Linux computer, and, and that really boils down to directories and files. And I think you know it sounds kind of boring, but um, I think understanding this. Um, facet of Linux systems is really important for doing bioinformatics. And um, that's just because that's how you actually get to all of the data and put results files in and copy them over to your local workstation is you have to kind of know how this works. Um, and also it's important for you using these types of computer systems generally, and it's because Unix and Linux um, have this, and I don't, I don't know if I'd call it like a core principle, I don't know if it's that strong, but it's, it's definitely a feature of these operating systems, is that, quote, everything is a file. And that means that everything that the computer can interact with, including, you know, input-output devices, so like this keyboard, um, we're running a, a Mac Mini here on, in the tutorial room, which is 
technically a Unix operating system, so it should behave a similar way. Um, the, there's a file on disk that corresponds to this keyboard, and there's one that corresponds to this mouse, and the operating system will like continually read data out of those files, and then that's how it interprets things like pushing keystrokes or moving the mouse around. And so like everything that the computer deals with is represented as a file somewhere. Um, and that includes, you know, your raw data, your, your process data, your final results. And so we want to teach you how to kind of find those and copy them over. And so my, my background, a little bit of a aside here, my background is in evolutionary biology. And this was a very convenient metaphor in that, you know, in evolutionary biology, we love trees. We think about trees all the time, or at least I do. Uh, and the way data is organized on the disk in the Linux system is very similar. It's like this hierarchical nesting structure. So in this cartoon here, um, each of these boxes here represents a directory, or you can think of it as a folder in your graphical shell metaphor. And this is just like the name. And the um, you'll notice as we get deeper and deeper into the tree, the names get longer and they have these slashes between words. Each slash corresponds to like the name of an intermediate folder. And then, um, it terminates or ends here in the actual file name. And so let's say I wanted to talk about this one specific file on my disk. We would start here at the very top of the tree with the first leading slash that's called the root folder or the root directory. And then underneath the root directory, we may have users, system, and then however many others. And then under the users, there's one for me, Tom Kono, and then maybe there's one for a guest, but I'm going to highlight this one. And then maybe under my directory, there's a file called data.txt, and so the full address to that file is slash and then users and then slash Tom Kono and then slash data.txt. That full sequence of uh, folders that you have to go through to get to this file is important. Um, and so the reason I bring this up is we'll be referencing a lot of long paths in the tutorial today. And so keep in mind that all of those slashes, like especially this little one at the beginning, and some of our exercises will address this, this little one at the beginning, which is really easy to miss, especially when you have a path that's like, you know, so long, um, it's very important. Um, so do make sure that you have that if you need it. Um, there's a little aside here about how trees are not a perfect representation of everything. You can read that if you want. And the uh, technical, as so I mentioned that, that slash at the beginning is very important. So technically, if you do have the slash at the beginning, it's called an absolute path. And if you don't have the slash at the beginning, it's called a relative path. And they're both, you know, perfectly fine ways to refer to a file. It's just absolute path is it's independent of wherever you're working on the system. It'll refer to the same location. And relative path is always relative to some point on the system. Where is this file? Um, and, you know, both, both work just fine. It's just if you're going to use one or the other, you need to keep in mind when you're going to use it and why you use it that way. Um, and, you know, I use both, and it's just sort of, you just have to kind of keep track of, you know, when, which one you're using and when. So, with that bit about files and directories, now we can talk about the actual structure of a command. So, um, command consists, consists of three key parts. Um, the first one, and the most important, is the program. The next one is the options or what kind of like variations on the behavior of the program you want to specify. And the last one is arguments. So the program is the, is the, it's actually a file, is the file that actually performs an action. The options uh, actually will modify the behavior of that program. And then the argument is what is the thing that you want the program to operate on? Um, so of these three things, the program is really the only essential one. We'll go over, uh, um, examples that have options and arguments and don't have options and don't have arguments. Um, but the, you have these three pieces and they're separated by space, by space characters or pressing the space bar. So if you're working with bioinformatics people and they grumble at you about pushing the space or putting spaces in file names, if you've ever had that, I think anyone who's worked with a bioinformatician probably has been like grumbled at for putting spaces in file names. This is why it's because the space is actually a meaningful character at the command line. Um, yeah, it can be a bit annoying, but there's ways around it. So like, it, it's not a it's not a you know deal breaker if you have spaces. It's just it can be annoying. Um, 
but that's how we separate programs from options from arguments as list spaces. And then when you're ready to send the command to the operating system, you push the enter key. Um, so there's just a reminder that you have to use left and right arrows to move your cursor around as you type commands. So with that aside, you know, everything's a file um, and the structure of a command, now we can actually start to enter commands. So the first one we're gonna run is a command that changes directories. And um, to do that, we're gonna use the CD program. And this is analogous to like, you open a, you, you double click on a folder on your computer and it opens a window that shows you the contents of that folder. That's like what CD does. It sort of moves you to a different location on the system. So in this screenshot of the terminal here, we'll start with CD, that's the name of our program, and then space because we're separating that program from, in this case, the argument of where we want to operate on. And now we're going to enter an absolute path here, slash home, slash risk, slash public. And I'll also mention, I'll make a call out here to this um, warning that I kind of blew by, which is that all of the commands and names that we enter here are case sensitive. So capitalization matters. Um, capital A is different from lowercase a. Um, so do pay attention to that too. And I'll, and I'll point out when we have capital letters. So cd space slash home slash risk slash public. Go ahead and I'll, I'll enter that here in this shell here so that we can go along. Is this big enough? Can people see this or should I make it larger? A little bit bigger? Okay, let's see if I can remember. How's that? Okay, so cd space forward slash home forward slash risk forward slash public, and then we're ready to enter the command. We press enter, and you see our prompt came back like immediately. The command ran almost instantaneously, and it's ready for us to move on. This little part here of the prompt has changed. This part shows us what directory we're currently working in. So it's like, yeah, it's like you clicked on a couple folders and navigated into this slash home, slash risk, slash public space. Um, and that's, oh, wrong tab. And that's all that does. So the next command we're gonna run is called PWD. It stands for print working directory. And that one is all you need is the program. You don't have to give it any options or an argument. So you just type PWD all lowercase and press enter. And what it does is it prints out the directory that you're currently working in. And in this case, it's a little bit of a silly example because we just CD'd somewhere we know where it is. Um, but as you'll find as you work on MSI, it's a really big complicated system. There's a lot of, and I mentioned that that tree is not a perfect, you know, it doesn't perfectly capture the structure of everything on the system. MSI is set up in kind of a complicated way where the tree isn't a perfect way to, to represent everything. It sometimes is good to know, like, you know, I've seeded through all over this place, like where actually am I? And PWD will tell you that. Um, so it is, you know, a useful command, even if it seems a bit silly to just say, hey, where am I? So the next thing we'll do now that we know where we are and have confirmed that we are actually there is we will list the contents of the current directory and we use the ls all lowercase command to do that. So in that case, this doesn't, we're also not gonna give it any options or any arguments. We'll just type ls and then enter and it'll give us a whole listing of files and folders here. We have a couple new files it turns out. Um, and but in this case, it's just, if you imagine like back to our graphical shell um, counterpart. Imagine looking at that window and then just seeing like a list of names there. That's exactly what we'd be looking at here. And I'll just tell you in this case, the red file, the reds is just a, a compressed file and then blue is another folder. So if we wanted to, we could CD into any of these folders and then similarly continue to look at them. This green is just a, a publicly viewable folder, I believe. Um, so yeah, we have a couple new things from when I took the screenshot. Um, so let's CD now, and we see that there's one called Pathway Analysis Tutorial that corresponds to what we're doing today. So let's CD into that one. And in this case, note that we do not have that leading slash at the front. This is a relative path. The Pathway Analysis Tutorial directory is relative to our current working directory. And that's what the, that's what the relative means. Um, so whenever you give a relative path, it's important to say relative to where. And so in this case, Pathway analysis tutorial is relative to slash home slash risk slash public. So that's why I'm, you know, important to make that distinction. So let's CD into pathway. And I'll give you a trick now. 
um, as you start to partially type a name of a file or directory on disk, you can press the tab key and it will fill in the rest for you. And I use this trick all the time, which is why I'm so bad at typing. You'll notice as I go through this, I'll make a lot of typos and it's because I've never typed a, uh, a full word, I think, ever since I learned about tab completion. Um, and so it's called tab completion. If you see like just chunks of paths completing on my shell, that's, I'm just pressing tab. Um, and you can press enter there and it'll just finish the command for you. Um, what's great about tab completion is, as you see here, um, for some reason, I've decided to mix uppercase and lowercase letters on the, on the directory name. That's fine. It's just sh pressing shift and all those letters can be kind of annoying. It's all those extra key presses and tab completion will finish all of that for you. And what's also nice is not only is it less typing, it'll finish the word correctly. Um, so you'll never get like a typo command not, or file not found if you can tab complete it. Um, so that's, that's super handy. Um, so just a reminder, we did not specify a leading slash and that's because it's relative to our current working directory. And great, we can list the contents of this pathway analysis tutorial folder too, and we'll see that there is one folder there that is just called test data. And we'll come back to that later. Um, and so we, we just will uh, we'll know about that for, for later in the tutorial. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to navigate to a special place on our system called Global Scratch. And we're going to specify a uh, absolute path to get there. And this particular, this is specific to MSI systems. If you work on other clusters, it might be called something different. But it seems like a lot of facilities have a similar setup, or it's like a almost like a public free for all data space. Um, so in this, in this case, we we'll call it slash scratch dot global. I think I note the leading slash. It's an absolute path. So from here, from pathway analysis tutorial, we're going to cd to forward slash scratch dot global. And again, tab completion will save us here. And we can press enter to finish that. You, you can type ls to list this directory, but I'll warn you that it might take a while because global scratch is like a really busy high volume file system. Um, hundreds of people at any given time are probably reading and writing and deleting data from the spot. Um, and so response times can be a bit low. So I, I'll, I won't type ls here. Feel free to if you want to, but I won't. I don't want to lock up my demo shell um, for that. So now that we're in global scratch, we're going to make a new directory here. And to do that, we're going to use the mkdir command. And, and as I mentioned, global scratch is a public and anyone with an MSI account can use it. So it's going to be full of all sorts of stuff from all sorts of people. And it's hard to keep track, especially, you know, like in my cartoon before, there's a file called data.txt. That's not a really great file name, but you can imagine, you know, many people may have a file that they want to call that in global scratch. So it helps to organize a little bit by your username, just so that you know everything written into that folder is something that you've written. Um, so we're going to make a directory just for that. So using the mkdir command, then that's the program and then space, and then you want to give it the name of the folder that you want to make. And in this case, I'm going to name it after my U of M ID. But because I already have a, a scratch folder named after my ID, I'm just putting an underscore TUT under it just to, for the tutorial purposes. You can call it, you don't have to put that on yours. You just have to remember it for later because we're going to use it later in the tutorial. Um, but for now, mkdir space and then my, oh, if I spell it, see, I can't type. Um, let's see. Yep. And it'll just make your directory and you're good to go. If it, like, let's say I'm gonna press up arrow to scroll back in the history. So if you need to, if you wanna reference a command that you ran previously, you can use up and down arrows to cycle through your command history. Um, if you already have a folder that exists, like let's say you came to one of our tutorials before and you already made this folder, you'll get a, an error, cannot create directory, it exists. If you see this, that's, that's fine. It just means you already have a directory that's named after yourself. Um, so just to show you what that looks like, I, I have, I tried my folder that I know exists already. Um, then of course we can CD into it. So CD, and this is a relative path again, remember CD space, and then the name of that folder that you just created. So CD space, 
And you can also, now that, now that this exists on disk, you can use tab completion and it'll fill in the uh, unique parts of the file name that it can. And next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy a file into our uh, global scratch area. To copy files, we're gonna use the cp command. And it takes, this, this command takes two arguments. It takes a source file or where, you know, what you wanna copy, and then a destination file or where you wanna copy it to, or the name that you wanna give it when you copy it. So for this particular command, we're gonna use kind of a long path name for the source. You can either copy it out of the web document if you're following along, or I'll, I'll type it, um, and I'll show you one that I can't type, and two, a little bit of nuance on tab completion. But we're gonna copy this file, and remember, even though we got this really long path, we have to tell it where to copy. Our, our destination will be the current working directory, which is uh, shorthanded by a dot or a full stop or a period in the command. So this screenshot here shows the full command, but I'll. I'll go through it and narrate it as I type it here. So CP, that's, we're going to start with CP. That's the name of the program. Space, because we're separating that program from the argument. It was in slash home, slash risk, slash pub, public. Again, I can't type. And then I'll start typing capital P, A, and then press tab. Pathway analysis tutorial auto completes in. And then if we press tab again, remember there's only one folder underneath this tutorial. It should fill in test data. And at this point, I don't remember or know what's in the test data folder. So I can press tab a couple twice. And what it'll do is it'll give you, it'll give you a list here. Here's the files that are in this directory. In this case, there are three. We see there's Drosophila melanogaster, edgar, deg table full.txt. This is actually the one we want. There's Drosophila melanogaster, table significant only, and then there's mus musculus edge r to eg table. What we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this uh, Drosophila melanogaster table. So what, we, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start specifying the file name that we, wanna, that we wanna copy. So we'll start by putting in capital D, and we can press tab again, and what'll happen is it'll fill in Drosophila melanogaster edge r to eg table, and then it'll stop. In this, in this case, it stops because there are two, two names now that potentially match this bit. If we press tab again, it'll, or twice again, it'll show us here's the two file names that potentially match. And you'll see, okay, table full or table sig only. We're gonna go with table full. So if you press lowercase f and then tab again, now, it, now that it uniquely uh, specifies a single file, it'll just fill in that entire file name. And now that we've gone through all of that, all of those tabs and, and specifying this long path, remember we have to tell it where we wanna copy. So uh, full stop or period or dot is the way you specify my current working directory. And if you press enter, hopefully it'll just happen. If you get, a, if you get an error message here, uh, let us know and we'll troubleshoot it with you. Um, Unix commands mostly run on a philosophy similar to the, the, the doctor, which is they only tell you things go wrong. So if, if you get nothing printed back, then it usually means your command worked just fine. Um, like one thing I often do, I'll just take a moment here, is I accidentally, especially after going through all the hassle of typing this really long path, is I often forget, oh, I need to tell it where I want to put it. And if you don't, if you don't tell it where you want to put it, then you'll see here, the CP command will complain at you and it'll say, hey, missing a destination, you need to tell me where to put it. Um, so at least it tells you when something's going wrong. Um, so now that we've done that, now we can type ls and list the contents of this directory. And we should see that we have our one file, which is that Drosophila melanogaster edge r eg table full. It should be in our current directory now. So those commands you know, are the ones that you really need to know there's a couple more that are very specific, but we'll go through those as the times as, as they come up for this specific pathway analysis tool that we developed. <clears throat> but to recall or to recap what we went over, CD is to change directory, PWD is to print your working directory, LS is to list your directory contents, MKDIR is to make new directories, and CP is to copy files. So from this point on, all of the commands I'm going to tell you to run are going to be written in that monospace 
um, font face that I mentioned before, mostly because I also don't want to take screenshots of like a dozen R commands. Um, and I think, you know, it's easier to, to show them and uh, to type them and to screenshot them every time. Um, also, you can copy paste if you want. If it seems like for naming these commands, if I'm just like throwing letter soup at you about, you know, here's just a bunch of letters mashed together, it kind of is. Um, unfortunately, that's just how the people who developed Unix came up with their command names and codified them that way. Um, I kind of think of it as like learning vocabulary for a new language. You just have to kind of memorize it at first. Um, but if you approach it in the same way and just sort of use it for not even not even hours, like 10 minutes a day or 10 minutes every other day, or just set up like a regular time to to practice it and just to practice navigating around and listing and copying files, um, you'll get the hang of it in no time, really. Um, it's, it's just sort of, you just have to kind of build up that muscle memory and that, um, yeah, that memory, basically. Um, so unfortunately, I wish I had a, a mnemonic to remember these things, but I just had to memorize them. Uh, if you go out and search on the internet, you will find cheat sheets that people have put together, and they have, you know, useful, you know, use these dozen commands. These are like daily users. Um, they have useful options, like there's a few commands where I just know the options because I use it so often. Um, you'll build up that kind of knowledge too, and there are cheat sheets that have like pre-compiled lists of that kind of information. Um, so if you find one of those that's useful, by all means use it. Um, it's just, you know, it's like another tool in the toolbox. Um, but it does take time to, to build up the knowledge of that. Uh, one, it, now I know this is in the outside information box, but I will um, call it out because I think it's very important. There is a command on Unix and Linux systems called man. It stands for manual page. And um, the command is man. And then the argument it takes is the um, name of the command that you want to view the manual page for. And it's this one is really useful. And I mentioned I, I remember a couple options. I don't remember all the options because that's, you know, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. I don't can't remember these like options on these esoteric Unix commands. But if I remember the man command, I don't have to. Um, for example, if you want to look at the manual page for make directory, you can type man mkdir enter, and it gives you I'm sorry, not zoom forever, give you <clears throat> a screen that looks like this, which tells you mkdir make directories, and then its usage information is mkdir, and then some number of options and then some number of directories and it tells you different ways you can modify the behavior of the make directory command um, and this is why i don't remember any of those options is because i can just look at the manual page and it lists them for me and then you know what i'll do is when i'm developing a new script or something and i want to tweak the behavior i will look at the manual page and then like on a separate piece of paper or something write down okay i want to use the dash m option and the the dash Z option and the dash P option, you know, I keep track of those because, again, I can't remember anything. If I read this manual page and wanted to use more than one or two options, I'd forget which ones I wanted to use. Um, but at least it's there. So, it, even though I didn't highlight it, the manual page is very useful for that. Um, so, with that, that's our command line refresher. Um, are there questions about that or people have you know, anything else they'd like to see? I'll mute for a second because I'm going to drink some water. Okay. All right then. So now we're actually going to dig into the um, pathway analysis tutorial tool. Uh, also, this will include a, um, a demo of using the graphical desktop and open on demand. So I know it seems a bit silly. We went through this like command line refresher and now I'm going to tell you to open a graphical desktop, but um, that's because we're also going to be looking at plots from the command line tool. And rather than have you like manually copying a bunch of plots over one at a time with an SFTP client or something, uh, we found it's easier to just open a visual graphical desktop on MSI, run 
command line stuff and then use the, the graphical desktop to actually look at the plots. So that's why we're doing it that way. Um, so what we're going to do is actually over here, we'll just press Control plus D, and that will close our, our command line session, and then we could just close this tab. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open a virtual desktop on MSI. So back to our Open On Demand tab. If you click on Interactive Apps now instead of Clusters, and then click on Desktop, so Interactive Apps and then Desktop, so click on that, and it'll take a second and open a web form like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to specify how we want to, what, we, what resources we want to give our compute job. So in this case, let's see if I can remember this. I just mentioned how bad my memory is. We're going to, have, we're going to use the agate cluster, use the tutorial account. If you register for this tutorial, you should be part of the tutorial um, MSI group. And then we'll use customs, custom in the resources drop down. Um, so let me, let me just start that right away here. So we'll use the agate cluster. We'll use the, uh, maybe, wait, this is, yeah. Oh, maybe not. Well, you, for, for Marissa's we'll use RIS, but for everyone else you should use tutorial. Uh, and then custom resources and then interactive partition. We want one node, one core per node, uh, 8192, memory. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's put in, let's put in a lot. Let's put in 24,000. 24, so our, our, in our tutorial document, we had 8,192, which was about eight gigabytes of RAM. We're gonna put in 24 gigabytes of RAM because some of the pathway enrichment analysis tools use, do use a lot of memory. Oh, I see, I have a chat message. Oh yeah, okay. Um, and then zero, zero scratch per node, zero GPUs per node, and four hours will be just fine because the tutorial only goes for the next 45 minutes. And then click the launch button. And what will happen is this will spin, and um, you'll see here we have a desktop session. It's queued, and eventually uh, desktop queued will change to running. Um, hopefully, hopefully it'll do that soon. We'll see if 24 gigabytes of RAM is too much. Um, the bigger your compute resource request is, the longer it'll stay queued. Um, but our interactive Q is pretty generous, so um, usually is at least. So hopefully, hopefully that starts. If it doesn't start in the next minute or two, then I'll, I'll turn, I'll scale back the uh, resource request. Oh, there it is. People who are not in the tutorial group. Oh. You don't have it either? Okay. Okay. Did you register for the tutorial online? Okay. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Did you did you register like really recently? No. Oh. Okay. I have the same issue. Hmm. So everybody click on your group you're part of and then launch yeah, I'm sorry about that. I will double check with our admins and figure out what's going on with that. We used to have a system that would automatically add people who registered for a tutorial to the tutorial group, but we've been in the process of changing and updating a lot of our kind of website plus systems connections, and uh, it could very well be that that broke. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, even though it says 8192 here for memory per node, put in 24,000. And that's just because I think 8192 is sort of at the cusp of large enough to handle some of these analyses. Um, and we don't want to, we don't want to go through the tutorial and have it be, oh, actually, we need more memory. <laughs> um, and, and it looks like our 
desktop just started. Uh, so now, yeah, it changed to running. And so then you can change these sliders. Um, compression, it, all these sliders do is adjust how well the image is drawn on your browser as you're looking at it. If you have if you have really high compression, you know, if you're on a connection that's kind of shaky or you have like limited bandwidth, you can put in high compression and low image quality. It'll look really pixely and and fuzzy, but it'll be usable. Um, for me, because I'm on a connection that's like in the same network as the servers, I'm going to turn compression low and quality high. But if you're connecting from remotely, you, you may have a different experience there. And then click Launch Desktop. And it'll open a new tab. And right there is your MSI graphical desktop. Uh, sure, looks like Chrome is telling me that On Demand wants to see and copy text and images. I'll allow that. Um, so now that we're here, we have um, an open On Demand desktop. And uh, we're ready to continue. So I mentioned it seems a bit silly, but hopefully this is useful. Um, we have the visual desktop. Now we're going to open a command line through the graphical desktop. So click on this Applications button, and then click on Terminal Emulator here. And it'll open a window with a very familiar interface for us. Uh, the reason I am doing it this way is because, yeah, I mentioned we're going to be looking at plots, and it's useful to have and, and the plots, when we generate them, are written to the MSI server. And rather than have you, you know, manually copy them one at a time, we'll just view them through the virtual desktop on MSI. Um, I'll just take a moment here and mention another nice thing about this is this session is still running. So what you could do is, is let's say, let's say you're you're working and it you go, oh, you know, shoot, I got to catch that bus at 4:30. Which, you know, it's real, right? It happens. You can close this, close your laptop, run out to catch your bus, and then if you if you wanted to log in once you get home, you you know connect to the VPN, you go to ood.msi.umn.edu, you log in, you click back on my interactive sessions, which will bring you here, and your desktop is still running. So even though I closed it, you can click on launch desktop and it brings you right back to where you were before. Um, and so it's a great way to have something running and you don't have to like worry about it dying as you have to change location or something. Um, and you know, we set it for four hours. We do have an option that lets you set it for like a day or a week. Um, now, of course, the amount of computational resources that you're allocated at that level is much lower. But you know, if you just needed, you know, oh, I wanted to look at those plots, you can just let it have it a really like a one core four gigabytes of RAM long-term desktop session running, and you just use it to look at plots. Like, you, we have options for that. Um, so on-demand is great for that. OK, so we opened our terminal emulator. Next, you, you'll see here we have these, these commands that are entered in monospace. So we're going to use the module command now to load a specific version of this cluster profiler wrapper. As I mentioned, that we have a tool developed in-house to run these uh, pathway enrichment analyses and gene set enrichment analyses. It's um, this module, and um, oh, me. Um, and so we, we're going to run this command. And you see that, again, this is kind of a long, nasty path. Uh, I'll show you how to copy paste text into Open On Demand now. So what we're going to do is we're going to highlight the text we want to copy, and copy it. And then you know this is unfortunately this is a little bit of a process, but it's just how it's set up for the open on demand. There's this little, hopefully it's showing up on Zoom, there's this little drawer. It's a little air icon on the left side of the window. You click on that. And then, of course, they don't label these buttons unless you mouse over. But there's this button that sort of looks like a clipboard. You open that and delete whatever's in there. And then right click and, oh, come on. Maybe I have to press Control V. No, 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 it's, please. You're supposed to paste the text into there. I hope it didn't disable that. No, okay, it didn't. Um, so paste, paste your text into this clipboard window, and then click back inside your desktop here, and then you can edit, paste, and you'll see that it pastes the 
text into your on-demand terminal. It's kind of annoying to have to do this, I know, but that's just the way that this like no VNC graphical desktop viewer is configured. I don't think there's a way we can change it easily, but hopefully, I, you know, I showed you that. Hopefully, it's easy enough to just do it. Um, Oh, it's not the right path anymore. So it, we have a 2.1 version now. Should we? Keg stopped working on that. <laughs> oh, should we use so, 2.1 instead? Yeah. Okay. We want to see keg results. <laughs> yeah, but we should do that. We'll use keg. Okay, so so for, for those on Zoom, I don't know if Marissa came in through the microphone. This version that we're using that we have pasted right here is actually broken. Keg changed something in the. Changed, yeah, the. So. So Keg updated the database links, and this version we have is won't work. So we're going to use 2.1 instead. Is it just changing 2.0 to 2.1 here? Um, yeah, the, the 2 test. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll change. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so module load home slash home slash risk slash public slash cluster profiler wrapper 2.1 slash module file slash 2.1. I'll update that in the newer version of the tutorial. Yeah, thank you. And then press enter and okay, good. Oh yeah, no, no error messages. So no news is good news, our command worked. And we'll just click on this error again to close that. Okay. Um, so now we, we will test that we actually loaded the module properly with this run underscore cluster profiler dot R. So, uh, a little bit about the software as you as you enter this into your terminal. Um, what the software module does is it just loads a very specific set of programs on MSI and make them available to you. In this case, because it's a script we wrote, um, we know that the name of the command is run underscore cluster profiler dot R. It's an R script, um, which is why I said dot R at the end. And then we're going to give it an option here, dash lowercase h which just says, show us the help menu for that. So we'll type run underscore, and I think tab completion works on command names too. So press tab and oh, tab twice and it'll show you, okay, we have, for some reason we have run anti, oh, this must be in Marissa's shell, run anti smash, et cetera. But we're gonna want run cluster profiler wrapper. So we'll start typing lowercase c, press enter, and it'll auto fill in the rest of that run cluster profiler dot R, and then we'll give it the dash lowercase h option for help. And if we press enter, you'll see that it prints out this long message that gives us a, a description of how we're supposed to run this, this program. And don't worry about reading it just right now. Uh, I'll highlight the important options as we run some, some sample commands. Okay. okay, so next we're gonna what we're going to start with is we're going to run over representation analysis with just what we're calling default parameters. So remember we made that that scratch directory that was named after our username and copied some test data into it. In our terminal, we're going to CD back into that location. So CD slash scratch global slash your internet ID here. So in this case, I'm going to use mine slash scratch global tab completion again. Chrome X006 underscore tutorial. So we CD back into that global scratch directory. And next, we're going to run this command. So um, the way we run cluster profiler.r is um, with default parameters or default options is the name of the program run cluster profiler.r. And then the first argument is the name of the file that has the uh, list of uh, the, the output of that differential gene expression table um, that Marissa mentioned, you know, full change p value, etc. That's in this file. Then you have to tell it what species these genes come from. In this case, they come from Drosophila melanogaster. Um, and then you have to tell it what type of identifiers are in that table. In this case, the gene identifiers are symbols or like, you know, like the named or the, the shorthand names of of genes. If you had ensemble identifiers or if you had NCBI entree identifiers, you could specify that as well. But in this case, we have symbols, so we're going to use symbol. So we're going to have, we're going to 
type our run underscore cluster profiler dot r and then the first yeah oh okay yeah so we're gonna use one command here to look at the the top lines or the head of a file and that's head so we'll type head space and then again I don't remember the full name of that file but I know it starts with a capital D and then press tab so we use head and then the name of the file we're going to look at and if you press enter it prints out the first like 10 or so lines of this file you'll see we've got gene log full change log cpm which is just like an average expression value a nominal p-value from a differential gene expression test and an fdr p-value or corrected value from a differential gene expression test so in this case there's the w gene there's the bmm gene there's the cg31832 gene um, these are gene symbols, which is why we're using symbols there. You may see like E and S something, 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 which is an ensemble identifier. Or you may just see like six digit numbers, which are NCBI identifiers. Um, that's what that gene column has. So back, we'll run, run underscore cluster profiler dot R. And the first argument is this file name. So you can use tab completion to fill in that long path. Oh, uh, control plus C. Yep, and that'll kill the current uh, command. Yep. Um, so, yep, first name is the first argument is the name of that file. So, in this case, we tab completed that long um, path name. The second argument is what species it came from. And again, this is um, case sensitive. We've got a capital D Drosophila underscore lowercase m melanogaster. And in this case, because it's not a file on disk, unfortunately, tab completion will not work. It's a name we have to type in. So let's see if I can remember how to spell this. Drosophila melanogaster. Oh, weird. Um, okay. And then the last one is what type of gene identifier we have. In this case, we have an all caps symbol, just like that. Um, so once you've got those three pieces of your command specified, you can press enter and it'll run the cluster profiler um, per package on this uh, DEG table with Drosophila melanogaster gene symbols as the identifiers. And I mentioned that some commands will take a, a few minutes to run. This is one of those. Um, so we'll just let that spin um, and hopefully it won't take too long. I mentioned Unix commands run on the, you know, no output means um, no errors. In this case, R and R script violate that principle a little bit. You'll see it's making a lot of text here. We're going to explicitly look for things that are called error, though. And I don't see any of that yet. Okay. Um, so while that's running, though, let me click back here and just make sure. Oh yeah, while that's running, um, we're going to open a file browser. So I mentioned when you type CD and stuff, it's kind of like you're clicking around files in a file browser. We're going to do just that now. So back in our applications menu, we're going to click on file manager while this is running or, or it just finished. Applications, file manager, and it'll open this a, a folder. We're going to type up in here that slash scratch.global slash our um, name and you'll see that it even like this file browser even does do some kind of like tab completion kind of thing and now you'll see here it's almost like it's listing the directory contents for us there's that text table that we copied that has the deg results and then cluster profiler wrapper made this new folder for us so we're going to navigate inside of there and here's all of the results that it generated for this differential gene expression table with defaults. Um, before I dig into it, let's see here. Yep, there's the browser we were looking at. Um, so in this folder, there's a couple things I want to point out before we start looking at all the plots. Um, we see that there are dot plot, CNET plot, and EMAP plot. So if you recall from the morning session with the lecture, those are those different displays of the enrichment results. And one thing that 
is um, not to not to you know give ourselves too much um, credit or whatever. Um, one thing that I do like about Cluster Profiler and Cluster Profiler Wrapper relative to some of the other enrichment tools is we do provide this parameter settings.txt file that actually lists out exactly what filtering criteria were used to run the enrichment analysis. I know from running IPA and from running um, David and Gorilla that you either have to like, write these down yourself or, or just trust that you that the defaults are appropriate because they don't really tell you very easily what those uh, settings are. But Cluster Profiler Wrapper will just, will, along with all the results, just give you a file. Here's exactly the thresholds we used, um, which are essential for describing and reproducing the results of this analysis. So um, that's just provided with our package. And then additionally, as you saw from the from the lecture portion this morning, you know, it's, it's great to have the, the plot that has all of the terms and the colored circles and the lines between them. But sometimes you want to actually know what are the numbers that are behind that plot? Like how many genes is that exactly? I can tell it's between 10 and 30, but I need, I want to know the actual number. We do provide table files that are called table something, and those actually have the numbers that went into making those plots. Um, so with that said, we can start to like double click on this. Let's start with the, the CNET plot and hopefully it'll open in a reasonable program on on demand. Uh, we'll see. Oh, it's opening with Chromium web browser. Well, maybe that'll work. I'll just give it a minute. Um, that is a weird way to open it. Let's see if I have something else to open that with. Okay, I guess we don't. That's weird. I thought for sure we had something else. Oh, I think it is opening. It's just very slow. Okay. Yeah, my uh, desktop seems to have <laughs> run into a bad state. Yeah, I want to terminate that. Okay, my apologies. That was weird. I mentioned Scratch is a very busy file system. It could be that someone's writing tons of data and it got a little bit uh, preoccupied. Okay, let's try that again. Let's see if I... Some, they say that the definition of insanity is you do exactly the same thing and expect a different result, so maybe I'm insane. <laughs> um, maybe I'm insane because it's doing exactly that. Well, um, that's unfortunate. Let's see if I can open a... Oh, yours works? Okay, so I must have just gotten onto a node that doesn't like me. <laughs> it's like, you're not Marissa. Um, okay, well, if you can open the... the the plot, that's fine. I can see from the thumbnail that this plot is a little bit hectic. There's a lot of labels and a lot of plot or dots that are just kind of on top of each other. Um, so maybe if in this particular result, maybe the this particular plot is not the most informative or what you might want to do is instead look down here at the, so this is, you can tell from the title, CNET, Go, all terms. So it's like everything in Go that was enriched. Um, what you could do is down here, there's this table go enrichment results, which you might want to do rather than have this like really highly, you know, plotted display is you could edit this file. This one will open. I know it's kind of ugly to look at, but you'll see here there's like a go term with a name and the actual um, number of genes that are in there and the number of background genes that were tested p values and then gene symbols what you could do is you know subset this table to identify just the terms you want and then plot those so everything in this table everything um, in this table is what is shown in this plot that my session can't open um, and so if you decide that i don't really like that display you can go back to the raw results and then 
pick and choose which terms you want to visualize. Um, which, you know, someone could criticize, you know, that, but I think that's a lot of, that's the way a lot of this display is done anyway. Like, it, yeah, as you saw in the, in the lecture session, um, there's, there's no, like, well, I don't, I'm not aware of a, of a statistically rigorous way to choose the best number of genes to test or the best database to choose for analyses. It's really about like what allows you to make the most meaning out of your results, I think, which is somewhat of an art. <laughs> um, this is being recorded too, so if someone wants to take that out of context, they can. Um, I'll stand by it too. I've, I've worked on enough genomics things to know that People like squinted things. They go, yeah, that's that. That means something, and that one doesn't. Um, similarly, there's one that's produced from the Reactome data set, which I'm not going to try to open. Uh, and then there's go go or sorry dot plots produced from go terms dot plots and some keg terms. Um, and so that's you know that's all on default settings. Let's say we want to uh, change those defaults because you know maybe we decide that our experiment does better when we are less stringent or are more stringent. Like we see that there's tons of terms from Go terms that look significant. Maybe we think, oh, there's probably a lot of like background stuff coming through and it's being treated as real signal and maybe we need to be more stringent. You can change those uh, settings by adjusting the um, options to the cluster profiler wrapper script. So in this case, we'll run it now. We'll actually, we're not gonna change the filtering criteria here. We'll, we'll rerun it the same exact um, criteria as before, but in this case, we're going to also ask for GSEA or the gene set enrichment analyses. That was the second half of the lecture session. So you'll recognize here these first three pieces are the same um, cluster profiler mapper.r, and then the name of the file that has all the DEG results, the species it's from, we're using gene symbols, and in this case, we're specifying two more options. This first one, dash dash GSEA equals true, says please give us GSEA results. And then dash lowercase d, and then the name is a new directory to put things in because as you see here, the, the default directory of cluster profiler results is already taken. I think that would cause an error in our uh, command, so we're not gonna overwrite the results like that. In our terminal window, you can press up to scroll back in the history and get that command that we entered before, and we'll just add new options onto it. So dash dash GSEA equals true in all caps, and then dash lowercase d, and of course, I just clicked away and I forgot, capital D, mel results GSEA, okay. Now, just like that. And if we do that, um, again, it'll take a couple minutes to run through everything. Um, we'll just let it do its thing and eventually you'll see a new folder will pop up here that's named up there it is exactly as we asked for on the command line and this directory if we click into it should start getting populated with files as soon as they are ready so we'll just let that spin for a minute i'll keep drinking water okay and while this runs, I will mention that when we ask for GSEA, the default behavior is to run only the hallmark gene sets. So there was a question this morning about how to specify other gene sets for testing with GSEA. We'll go over that in the next command. But when you ask for GSEA and don't specify anything else, the default is to just run with hallmark. And you see here that it was testing all those hallmark pathways. Um, that's what those are about. Um, and if you can open the plots, which I'm not going to try, two times is enough for me, um, then you'll see that all of these results should look identical, except for we now have an msigdb gsea folder. And there it is. Okay. So all of these cnet plot, dot plot, et cetera, should be the same. Um, in here, though, we have these two new folders. In msigdb gsea, we have GSA results and actually as a spreadsheet, we have a dot plot that shows which gene sets from our gene sets are uh, were significant and at what level. And then here in the H, we have those, um, you remember those uh, random walk or enrichment score plots that Marissa was going over this morning with, with that green line that goes as more enrichment or, or 
less enrichment. You'll see that we have those here for each uh, gene set that was tested is part of GSEA. Um, and so, and I think this only shows you the ones that are significantly enriched or, or, or enriched in one direction or the other. So you can go through and look at those and decide, um, you know, if you think those results are meaningful or not. And I haven't looked actually at the supplemental fold files. Um, oh, I think this is like a list of, so um, Mirsa also mentioned that it's important to save the ranking of the gene set just so that you have reproducible results. You can find that here in the supplementary files folder. So the pre-rank.tsv file, I think is the uh, ranked gene set or the drink gene list that was used for gene set enrichment analysis. And then I think it's a subset here in the less calls.tsv. Um, and I think this is just a record of what uh, gene sets were tested. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, this is, this is a, or this is the, um, the table of, yeah, significant gene sets. You see hallmark DNA repair, mitotic spindle, heme metabolism, um, so the, the numerical and reproducible files from GSE are present here in the supplementary files folder. So we're gonna go back up here. And um, next we're going to keep kind of iterating on this for the last section of the, um, for the tutorial here. So again, you'll see here, the first parts of our um, command are the same. So we can just use the up arrow in the terminal to scroll back and then add new pieces to our command. What we're gonna add now is, let's say we want to specify which sections of msigdb we wanna run. And in this case, so I mentioned, if you remember, I mentioned or we mentioned this morning that msigdb is really just human and mouse. And so you're like, well, you get Drosophila melanogaster, what's going on here? Um, is we're using homology mapping information here. In this case, we're trying to translate whatever homologs in Drosophila melanogaster are to human or mouse. So as you know, um, that's a pretty distant jump we're making. Um, certainly there are some genes that have conserved function between humans, mice, and Drosophila, um, but there's a lot that won't get carried over. So we're showing how to run this now, but um, you should, Take, at least specifically take the msigdb results with a little bit of a grain of salt, I think, just because you know it's pretty distant from whatever gene sets are gonna be deposited there. But certainly the reactome and the keg results are gonna be in the goat results are gonna be fine. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're using a mouse or a human experiment though, your msigdb stuff will be much more relevant. Um, so in this case, we're gonna use the up arrow, we're gonna enter almost exactly the same command as before. In this case, we're, we're gonna add this option, msigdbs with an S at the end, and we're gonna choose a comma separated H, C2, CP reactome, C5 go biological process, and C2, CP keg. And because I'm definitely not gonna type that correctly, I'm gonna to try to copy this little section and paste it into the on-demand desktop. So let's repeat our command here. And I don't know why it's like, oh, it must be because when I open that drawer, it like clobbers the, the um, clipboard. Okay, so up arrow, and then we'll just paste that new option in and it will just go just like that. And we'll press enter. In this case, we are specifying the same output folder. I guess it'll just put new files into that same folder and it won't, it won't complain. Yeah, well, that's something you should be careful about because this will really change a lot of the parameters. It's going to start overwriting files that are in, if you like, don't change the folder name, it's going to start updating files in there, but you, know, you could have mixed results. Okay, yeah, so just to repeat, um, I don't know if, if, in case Marissa didn't come over to the microphone, um, that you have to be careful because what cluster profiler wrapper will do is you saw we specified the same output folder as a previous run. It will just overwrite some of the results from the previous run and it won't complain and throw an error message. So it would be, it would be better to have new output folders for each different run, just so that you know that each folder has the results of just one cluster profiler wrapper run rather than mixing and matching, which can be confusing and misleading.
Dryad was, you can look at the um, what's it called the results folder. There is a session info and parameter settings. So each file will basically tell you what like what parameters were used to supply your data set. So you can kind of write that in your package section. It's, it's more clear what was what was done. And if you look at this too, you can see that full change thresholds were applied prior to running over your orientation analysis. So if you don't like <laughs> thresholds that are being used here, feel free to change them. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so Marissa mentioned if you're if you're uncertain of whatever was, if you know, let's say you ran some analyses and then you came back to them a day later and you don't remember uh, what were the settings I chose, this parameter settings.txt file in cluster profiler results or whatever results folder that you've designated gives you a list of all of the settings that were used to generate that, um, that batch of results. And she mentioned that there are it does record a full change threshold. I'm like trying to read it here. I think it's here. It does specify a full change threshold. So in this case, log two of one. So basically everything, no, no, effectively no, um, or basically two X um, over or under expression. Um, if you don't, if you decide that you need to be more or less stringent, you can specify options to change this, um, but it's, it's recorded there in the, in the text file, what is the threshold that was used? Same with the p-value threshold. Right, and then there's also a threshold for number of views. So even after applying those thresholds, it will still take the top two hundred. You need to hate that. You can set that to like four. Like using, and at the very at the very end line, will tell you how many views were actually used for each analysis. You know, based on all the thresholds you set. Again, this only applies to over-representation analyses, not the SDA. Right, so um, Samarissa also mentioned here that in addition to these p-value and full change thresholds, um, cluster profiler wrapper will auto automatically limit the number used for over-representation analysis to this number here. So if you have like 800 genes that cross these thresholds, it'll still only take the top 200 that, that pass them. And at the very end here, it'll tell you what's the final number of genes it used for over-representation analysis. And all of these uh, options are tunable via the command line. And there, it just finished. So, Close that, and now if we we're, not, we're back here in our DML results GSEA folder. If we open our msigdb, you'll see that we have a bunch of new folders here now. In addition to just Hallmark, we now have those three additional partitions of msigdb that we asked for. We have the C2 CP keg, C2 CP reactome, and C5 Go biological processes. And in there, you'll see we have the the GSEA results for those. So. Um, in this case, we have both over-representation analysis results for KEG pathways, and now we have GSEA results for KEG pathways. So recall that GSEA uses all expressed genes, and then um, over-representation analysis uses that filtered subset. And so you can kind of get both views of these um, functional annotation subsets from these results. Oh, we have a question here. Um, are you answering that? In Text yeah. sound. Okay, sorry. No, no, no. Before, but I'll just write it again. Oh, okay. So the question is, how many groups can we compare the pathway abundance results, like control versus treatment one? Um, so this, um, the tool works on the outputs of differential gene expression analysis. So you can, as many uh, tables as you have comparisons, you can run it through this tool, but it'll do it one at a time. Um, so it'll, it'll work on any kind of differential gene expression table that you have. Um, I'm wondering if they are meaning like if they do differential gene expression and are with like four groups, so it's like all by all comparison and you're doing a table of all different types of genes that was used. I mean, you could definitely put it through cluster profiler, but it's less clear, <laughs> it's a less clear um, result because you don't know which group that gene is differentially expressed for, like through group comparison. 
Right. Sorry, that was confusing. Oh, so Marissa is saying, yeah, if you have if you have a table that has the results of multiple or or a more complicated differential or di yeah, different differential expression test, um, you can technically run it through cluster profiler wrapper. You'll just have to be very careful about how you rank those genes so it's clear that you're ranking it on a specific some specific metric that that gets at what you're interested in. So like if you've got four groups, maybe you're interested in um, group one and two, uh, the, like the difference between group one and two relative to the difference between group three and four. I don't, I, you know, I cannot improvise an experimental setup that would necessitate that kind of design, but it is possible. It's just, you have to come up with a ranking mechanism that like gets at that. And then you can run it through um, cluster profiler wrapper. So it's very flexible in that way. All you really need is some way to rank the genes and it'll, it'll kind of go through everything like that. Um, so that's like the bulk of the actual commands we're going to run. So we've got a few minutes at the end. So what I'll do is I'll show you here at the end, we mentioned a couple times that you can adjust those filtering criteria. So, um, and of course, these are all like listed in the help options too that we looked at earlier. So let's say, for example, you ran a, some differential gene expression results and the signal was a little bit unclear, the, the expression responses were not, you know, really strong and your p-values were, were kind of weak as a result. Um, I've had a couple experiments like this where um, one of them was with mice brains and the reason the, the hypothesis for that one was, you know, maybe the gene expression is not the primary mechanism underlying the response because there's a lot of neurotransmitter stuff that happens and maybe you don't expect a gene expression response to be the primary mechanism by which things are changing. Or if you have um, a, in some biopsies that are really kind of hard to get because the, the tissue is really small or it's, it's contaminated with a lot of off-target tissue or cells and the, um, therefore the gene expression is not really as clean as you thought it would be. There's a lot of reasons why your p-value might not be super strong. Um, but if that's the case and you want to decrease that stringency, you can use the dash lowercase p option here. And instead of, as you saw in the um, parameter settings.txt file, the default is 5% or 0 0.05. Let's say you want it to be more lenient and go up to 0.1 or 10%. You could just put that into your command line and it'll change the thresholds accordingly. And it'll update that parameter settings.txt file to record that you're using a new p-value threshold. Um, similarly, if you think, oh, well, 200 genes isn't really giving me enough of the, of the genes I think are interesting, I want to capture more genes after all of the filtering and want to make sure that I'm searching with a larger query set size, you can use the dash lowercase g option here to change the number of um, the gene number filter that cluster profiler imposes. So by default, it's 200. Let's say you want to increase to 400. And just a reminder here, that p-value threshold and gene number threshold do not affect GSEA because that uses every gene in the table. It's only for over-representation analysis. Um, and I also mentioned here that this is where it's a little bit more of a, of a squishy thing and not as, um, not as, maybe not as rigorous as one might hope, is that you just have to try it and see what you get out of it. Um, when a couple of years ago, when Kaijin came here and did an IPA tutorial, I remember the, the field scientist saying, yeah, about 300 to 600 genes is a good number, but try different numbers and see and just find one you like, um, which, you know, suggests to me that you should, you, you do just have to kind of try it and see. It's not super satisfying um, because it'd be nice to know what the right thing to do is. Um, but regardless, I think the best we can do in that circumstance is say, we tried different things and here's the one we're gonna use going forward. And here's the full description of the filtering criteria that we have to make sure that it's like very clear that this here's how we handled the gene set going forward. Um, at least anecdotally, I found that between 150 and 500 is a quote good number of genes for overrepresentation analysis. Fewer than that, and it's hard to distinguish true hits in a given term from just random background sampling. And too many, you kind of get the, uh, the opposite problem, which is the background has so many hits, it's hard to tell what's enriched relative to a background that's full of hits. Um, and so when you, get a, when you get very far above 500 genes in a typical eukaryotic experiment, you start to like get a lot of 
what look to be unrelated processes showing up as enriched just because it sort of accidentally gets a lot of hits in it. So in the last few minutes, I'll mention here that um, you know, we made, we made a couple of passing references to species that are supported by this tool. Um, so MSIGDB and really supports just human and mouse, but in our cluster profiler wrapper tool, this is the list of species that we have support for. Um, so Bose Taurus, C. elegans, dogs, zebrafish, fruit flies, chickens, humans, mouse, rats, brewers, yeast, and pigs. Uh, so if you're using one of those species, your, your um, data are supported just like innately by cluster profiler wrapper. Uh, if you're not using one of those species, but you're using something really close to it, you can try to convert the gene names into something, into one of these species, and then, and then it'll go through cluster profiler wrapper. You just have to pretend like if you're using, um, you know, a different, if you're using like a, stickleback fish, you might have to pretend that you're analyzing, I hope, I think, yeah, that is, stickle, if you're using stickleback, you might have to pretend you're analyzing zebrafish. Um, but, you know, you can kind of, you know, uh, come in through the side that way. Also note that the species names are case sensitive. I know it's a little bit annoying to have to type it out that way, but they do actually correspond to names that are coded in R, so it has to match up with what the R script wants. Um, so that is all the material we had for pathway analysis tutorial today. Um, I'll send out a link with the slides and this document to everyone who registered, so you can refer back to this anytime you want. We did record this session, and we will have it posted on our YouTube channel. I'll <clears throat> include a link to our YouTube channel uh, in the email, or if the video goes live before then, then I'll just include a link to the video. You can you know, watch me talk through it all again. Um, yeah, so um, with that, I'll just hang on for a few minutes and take questions. Otherwise, you're free to go, uh, and thank you.